support people oh, yeah. providers, also known as characters in the next novel. <laughs> and in Paris in the novel, also known as characters in the first two novels. Turn that shit out. That's about for material. Back to the workshop. Okay, I'm going to introduce my friend Donnie. Um, she's been published here and there and is currently working on her MFA in writing at Pacific University. Donnie thought up this gig and had the first word come two years ago. Donnie likes Pilates, walking on the beach, and enjoys good wines for a at the country club. Getting 40 love, Tim King, or not. You can catch Donnie zooming around town or shooting a shift in the little backyard oasis created out of necessity and appreciated out of love. Personally, I love Donnie. She walked up in heart and soul and brains and beautiful words with an acute empathy. She is right on. In case you haven't been to one of these readings before, um, those of us who are writers extend our bios in to people. I didn't write that last part. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Kristen. But just a few days ago, um, a couple weeks ago, I reconnected with a friend of mine that I knew in high school. And, well, that's what we had. And, yeah. So my friends Kelly and Patty are here that I like, knew in junior high and high school. Oh. <laughs> Freedom of acts to win over piss and paper any day. That's 
connecting with the choice. You're about to run the choice now. The spasms there are stopping, and everything's clenching up right up to that port gut watery mouth point of no return. The water guy comes back and he goes out to the door. She comes back, and you're like 20 feet ahead across the parking lot, up the slope, over the lift, down the hall, and to the bathroom door. Over the lift, I fucking kick you not. And then the slope. A fucking 90 degree angle and a slope, and you can't unclench or you'll get drenched. Then her hands on your back. She gives you a push. All of you four men are here. Thank you. Yes, 
and leads you in Josephine to a white sports car with creamy leather interior and an Italian emblem with a red cross and a green serpent consuming or birthing a child. You all sit in one tight row with Josephine in the middle and he speeds down 320th for a Puget Sound and you try to hold your long dark hair back until you give up and let it whip in the wind around you stinging your face. Juan drives you back to Des Moines and drops you near the marina at a little print shop where you'll have some developed film to pick up. He asks if you need money for the film. You take the money, realizing this is the first thing, apart from the coffee and dark features which set you so apart from your mom's blonde Swedish family that your father has given you. He speeds away in his Alfa Romeo, the serpent with the child, reaching from his mouth shrinking, and you think, father, father, letting the strange words roll around through your jaw and throat and mouth. Pushed that door right to the open and saw the kid hanging there. 
Even after all of them flew out, there was still a gazillion flies around the kid. Flies sent them. Tried to shoot some away so I could look at him. Maybe 19, 20, something like that. No telling how long he was hanging there, but I was first to find him. White purple backpack on the floor. Had a bunch of patches on it. He signed, black fist, one of those homo rainbows. His belt was looped over the ceiling pipe and thrown around his neck. Oh, fuck. That's what I saw. You don't have to worry about my driving. I pulled over there for a minute. So what I see, this morning I saw Snowy Plover, Plover, however you say it. Snowy Plover nest on the beach at New River. New River, that's on my roof. How I know it's a plover is because there are signs all over the beach talking about how fragile the eggs are. I'm not a tree hugger or anything, but the nest was right there on the sand where anyone could walk on. It's true I probably shouldn't have been walking on the beach on work time, but that's one of the things I like about my job. I don't report to anyone, I don't even see anyone. You get kind of lonely. I like it, and I don't like it, you know what I mean? State parks, that's my route. It takes a dozen, dozen guys to do it. It's not like national parks, which Oregon only had one of. Crater Lake, until Clinton. Now there's a bunch of them. National monuments, history parks, wildernesses. I'm not saying it's bad, the federal. It's a sweet route. Steens, Dennis Percy, the Bosselbeds. I'd take it in a heartbeat. Except for that Lewis and Clark stuff up out of Columbia. It's an easy swing. And the bed's got great pennies. Pension even. My room, well, that's a whole other thing. So what I see right now, sandy beach down at the bottom of the cliffs, rocks in the water, big rocks, blue sky where I am, but a big ass cloud bank right offshore. Scrub pine, bushes, lots of birds, gulls, hawks, ravens, or maybe they're crows. Crows are taking over the place. Sneaky birds. Smart, too. That's a bad combination. I forgot trees. Jesus, how could I forget trees all those years running the skitter? Trees every damn where, all kinds of them, but mostly dug fir and pine and spruce and hemlock and redwoods <laughs> down by the state line. See, my room takes me all over the place into campgrounds and parks and past trailheads, so I know what's going on. I cover the southwest. It's pretty lonely most of the time, except right when I'm working. I hitch up my nozzle to the alcohol tank and just suck it all up. What, what travelers leave behind? Shit. I, I'm talking about shit and piss. Blood, throw up, tampons, divers, all the stuff people toss in the jar and walk away. They don't always flush when they got a chance to, but with the lid down, the backcountry jars, the ones that are just full, down to nothing. Those will be smelly ones. <laughs> the clearest mulch rooms with the big vents straight to outside, those are the nice ones. So I go once a week, hit every state john in southwest Oregon, check the soap, put in a bunch more rolls of toilet paper, mop the floor, suck up the shit, suck up everything. It's a job. Good job, too. Except for the 10 minutes when I'm actually doing it. The rest of the time I'm driving, seeing the scenery. Mulling it all over, life, living and dying, animals and trees and people. I'm 55, double nickels. You wonder what I see on my route? Every week I see stuff different from what I saw last week. Late today, guy south of Coos Bay cut down all the screen trees, the ones between the road and all the rest of the stumps. You gotta be pretty hard up for cash to cut the screen trees. Someone else put up a sign by Flores Lake says, Stop burning trash! All capital letters and an exclamation point. Those are the kind of small town few that can lead to fights or worse. I've seen it over and over. Well, I can see it. Heard about it. Seen the result. My philosophy life here is cheap. I don't mean street crime. I mean people don't care whether they live or die. Not if it interferes with them having fun out in the wild. Don't care if their kids live or die, me either. I see it all the time, babies falling out of boats and drowning. Parents don't believe in life jackets. Little kids, five years old, driving ATVs. Hit a rock and flip it, go on. High school kids from Bandon get their license from drinking and partying and pile right off the cliff at Seven Devils Road. Dead kids. Not planning to die anytime soon myself. Lately, I got the idea I might die someday. This is really stupid talking to myself. 
an oral diary, oral, that just makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm gonna turn off this Julie key and check to see if it's working. Okay, I'm back. It's working, I guess. I don't sound anything like me, but the guy on the tape said all the things I said, so I think he's working okay. <laughs> that kid, you kind of say, well, what's this? He doesn't seem to want to cut him down, but I knew I should leave him for the cops. And I didn't want to get near those flies. The bathroom was empty except for the backpack and the kid and the flies. Funny thing, though, that restroom didn't smell at all. No shit smell, no dead smell either. Sweet, the fungus motion. Shook me, Doc, I admit it. Never seen anything like that before and hope to hell I never do again. I just can't get the picture out of my head. I guess it's kind of haunted me. I guess that's why I'm talking to this Julie key. Gotta go back, gotta get over it. Okay, there's an angel, just flew over the road. Blink head and all. You'd think I've seen a lot of them, but you'd be surprised how many eagles turn out to be hawks. What I'd really like to see, puffins. End of the day, I'll be in Harris Beach, almost the state line. They say there's puffins there, but I've never seen them going on two years now. But I'd like to see one, not that I'm a tree hugger or anything. Here's Battle Rock, where I stopped for lunch. I like to look at Humbug Mountain in the water while I'm eating. A plaque in the parking lot calls it a battle there wasn't much of one. A bunch of Indians live there. White settlers show up. Indians don't want them moving until they hassle them. White guys climb on top of the big rock in the water and hang out for one night they escape. Time passes. Whites settle up and down the coast. A bunch more skirmishes. Indians killing settlers. Settlers killing Indians. Indians getting the worst of it. 10,000 Indians around the Rogue River in 1851. 2,000 left five years later. Braves, squaws, kids, everybody killed. Blacks don't mention that. The ones that were left all marched off to the res, and that's why there's no Indians in southwest Oregon. That's why I don't go climbing up on a big rock, neither. I don't know if it's really haunted what people say, but there's a sea cave in the big rock right by the sandy beach. Somebody could get stuck in there if they went in at low tide and didn't pay attention. Okay, I'm back, talking to the doohickey again. No puffins at lunch. Tuna on white. <coughs> kind of sad eating fish by the ocean side. I wonder if the fish can smell it. <laughs> so what I see? Driving the switchbacks around Humbug, I see a lot of slow traffic in the summer. RVs and trailers, regular cars, trucks. Always driving too fast. They got those heavy loads, gravel and rocks. Tears up the road for everyone else. I see trees and more trees. I see ocean through the trees. I see an eagle on the side of the road. No, wait, not an eagle. A fucking turkey vulture eating something dead. Oh, Jesus, that took me back. Back to the rest stop, what I saw. Oh, nice looking kid, but I could see him. Couldn't see his eyes because, sorry, because, couldn't see his eyes because of the flies. Pulling into the wayside now, where I saw it, saw him. I just don't understand how someone's so young. Here's a rest area. Stupid name, nobody rests here. The one's called the Welcome Center is even stupider. I like what they call it, an RV park. Dump site. That's what this is, a dump site. There's the John. You said, take the duty key and keep talking while I go in. Retrace my steps. So, okay, I'm getting out of the truck. Shut the door. You need to oil those hinges. Walking up the path. I'm in front of the door now. Easy enough to just go in. Hand on the door. No doorknob, just push to open it. It's locked inside. I'm cracking the door now. No flies today. No problem, really. I'll just push that door a little more. Or maybe not, not today. Today I'd like to see a puffin. I'm not going to free hopper. It's just all this time alone every day. So much to think about on the road. So much to see. Next up is Fiona George. Fiona is a Portland native and a student of Tom Van Bauer. Her work has been published in Neo Magazine, The Manifestation, 
and the United Station. She is working on her first novel very slowly. I think one day we're going to be able to say, I knew Kayla Malone. She's a beautiful woman. Her music is that of a sensitive poet, and she's a hell of a writer. Welcome, Kayla. <laughs> Fabric, maybe sweat more. 
I felt like it pulled my boots down to my belly button and it was past my waist. Over my head and bright, bright clothing store light in my eyes, the corset pulled down to where my hips were going to grow, unlaced and humbling around me. Went on to lace it up with the worst of it. First of all, the strength, I didn't expect it. My rib cage pain worse than sore from laughing, like I could break. Looked down and watched my torso get pulled into a shape that wasn't hourglass. Saw my brand new boots jiggle with every tug of the laces. My stomach felt smaller, my lungs even smaller than my stomach. My torso pulled into a kind of log shape, no waist and hips to speak of. My chubby chest pulled flat. I bet it looked bad. I didn't bother to look in the mirror. I looked at Annika. She knew it was bad. Her lips together like a camp's kiss, big black eyes twitched and her black eyebrows. Up and down my torso twice before she said anything. When something looks good, you don't have to think that long before you say so. <laughs> don't know what I would have done without Annika. She knows things about corsets and everything else. Her voice is a fat, solid and trustable. Get the sense she'd sound like that even if she was lying. You should find someone with class in the front, she says. And this one's bony, this one is really stiff. I didn't even know that the stiff parts were called bony or that there were different kinds of it. <laughs> My voice is miffed, sock full of doubt. Barely enough breath to push it out. Yeah, I say, I can't breathe. <laughs> She pulls the laces loose from my body and breath with them. I'll go find another one for you, she says. Let me get out of this one. Annika walks past me with the confidence of someone who looks like a woman in a corset. It smooths easy through the curtains of the dressing room. Me left behind, slumped like my unlaced corset. Face the mirror just once, real quick. The corners of my eyes try to hold on to my tears. I don't look like a woman. I look like I was in a full body cast or a defective straight jacket. I didn't know how to get out. <laughs> Just in that way, he would live in the ER forever. 
Besides, any form of trauma was easier than raising Danny and Nick on his own. Tom was searching for years and written textbooks on what to do and when and how. They developed the Advanced Trauma Life Support System to help systematically evaluate and treat patients. But who assessed your performance with your two sons and suggested ways to better handle sibling rivalry or teenage drug use? No one but knew, that's who. The few books Cliff had seen on parenting dealt with babies, but babies were a chip shop. Play with them, teach them Ben, Brian, and Chance Brewer, they'd be happy. But what about a Woody Fifty year old with a driver's permit who thinks you're a dumb shit and then wants you to take him out for driving practice? What about two teenagers who think you, their father, are partly responsible for their mother's death? And what about bringing in two sons familiar tricks better than you? To Cliff, parenting is like being stuck at the bottom of a hundred foot mine shaft. Sunlight hit the bottom maybe for a couple minutes a day. And someone, and occasionally someone by mistake kicked in a garden spade or half a bullion sandwich. But for the most part, and especially after his wife Sylvia died, Cliff turned it alone and from a hole. Maybe for that reason, not all Cliff's trauma work was fun. He didn't like caring for injured kids, victims of domestic abuse, near drownings, electrocutions, poisoning, and other brutal traumas to which children were predisposed. He took call from the coastal town of Florence, Oregon and the resident beach walkers, swimmers, surfers, kayakers, fishermen, and recreational boaters were all just one flash away from dying in the ocean they set out to enjoy. Road waves, killing of tides, sudden storms, and numbing water. Combine them, and they could ruin anyone's day. When the near drowning victims arrived in the ER, Cliff could do little for them. And Cliff couldn't stand having little to do. If Cliff were a professor or an architect instead of a surgeon, his job wouldn't require someone else's misfortune to provide him work. He mentioned it once to his wife, Sylvia, a few weeks before she drove her Corvette over the rock face near a Cedar Head lighthouse. She and Cliff were separate at the time, but her smear still gouged him like a knife to the gut. You'd be a basket case if you weren't a doctor, she said. How could she have said that? To Sylvia, he'd always been a doctor. He met her at a party during his general surgery residency after medical school, and since that bonfire on the beach, his life has been elbows to assholes with scalpels and stethoscopes, peritonitis and proctoscopes, laparotomies and laparoscopes. Still, if he had a normal job, she might have stayed around, he might be closer to his grown sons, Danny and Nick, and Nick might have avoided this slow dance with ghosts. If Cliff had gone into a different profession, Danny and Nick might have followed and not entered medical school themselves. Cliff didn't know the figures, but children seem more likely to follow a parent into a given field than take up an unrelated occupation. Not that Cliff had followed anyone, because his father sold tractors in South Dakota, and Cliff, in his 61 years on Earth, had never sold anything larger or slower than a used Ford Fairlane. These days, Cliff drove an explorer and this morning, he pulled into the hospital parking lot and started the surgery call day with a gut ache, an acid-filled chasm not helped by seeing an ambulance pull up to the ER at 7.15 a.m. with his lights flashing and the siren wailing. You'd think after taking calls for over 25 years, he'd have gotten used to the interrupted days and sleepless nights of the call day. But the adrenaline of calls came with a price. He suffered from acid reflux, and his throat often burned more the night before call. The ultimate burrito and pitcher of ham at Tidings last night didn't help. And this morning, his upcoming 24-hour call shift felt like a three-foot-long chain wrapped tightly around his waist with the chain's other end bolted to the middle of a concrete floor where everything he needed, antacids, his prostate medication, a bolt cutter, waited at the room's perimeter 10 feet away. He stopped out a cigarette and met the EMTs hauling a guy in a stretcher into the ER with an Oregon State Trooper following close behind. Cliff entered the trauma room just inside the building, and Mike Patron, the ER doc working that shift, frowned at him. Everyone in the ER knew his frown meant good morning. <laughs> Cliff went from Mike to the gurney. What's this? ex con with a stab wound, Mike said. A real winner. On the stretcher, a white male who looked to be in his 40s grunted and pushed his deformed hand against the metal railing. A gray blanket covered his torso, and his bare feet stuck out below. Tom Jose stood to the side with his shiny state patrol craft tightening the crew cut he kept shorter than Cliff's. A quiet little lab tech sporting a ponytail 
collected a lot from the guys for the rest of the trauma team, two nurses and the nursing supervisor, the pharmacist, the respiratory therapist, jumped into action. Their morning now infected with excitement not found in their coffee cup. Kayla, a recently divorced nurse who used to work at Harborview in Seattle, placed a second IV while Gwen hooked him up to monitor his vital signs. Gwen had worked there longer than Cliff and could no doubt run a trauma code better than him. Megan, their nursing supervisor, recorded the proceedings on her form. She just returned from maternity leave and already talked about having another one. Looks like Friday night in the big city, Kayla said. Gwen nodded. I'm glad he learned self-control in prison. Cliff pulled the blankets covering the patient's torso and dark red 4 by 4 dressings in his left upper abdomen leaked blood down his flank. Under the dressing, Cliff saw the source, an oblique three centimeter stab wound. The site continued to ooze, so he replaced the pressure dressing. Leroy's noticeable biceps and pectorals suggest he once took pride in his body, maybe still did. A raised scar on the back of his right hand pointed to his missing index and middle fingers. Not even stubs remain. He coughed and his abdomen rolled outward. An abdominal scar on the midline extended a few inches above and below his umbilicus. Reddish brown hair covering his lower abdomen stopped at a jagged line of his pubis. His well developed quads indicated high school football or track back before he'd narrowed his life. Cliff asked him how he lost his fingers. Leroy licked his lips. My ex wanted our daughter to go to public school and I wanted private school. He made her case with a meat cleaver. <laughs> Mike snorted. Yeah, right. In any case, the guy's a little who dies. Cliff looked at the trooper. How long was this night? Jorge held up his outstretched hand. Eight inches, give or take. Cliff glanced at the monitor. Pressure 86, pulse 138. Even with the oxygen mask, the dose of saturations were low at 91%. Type and cross four units. He may need uncrossed type blood. Until the OR, I'm exploring it. Mike glared at Cliff. The blood bank called earlier, they're low on blood. Cliff didn't waste time returning his look. Then we'll do what we can. The patient raised his free arm and the IV tubing caught on the bed and the IV dislodged. He sat up partly in grimace. Jason, the more senior paramedic, grabbed Leroy's matted hair and yanked him to the stretcher. Settle down, boy. With his head pinned back, Leroy opened his green eyes. Like it says in Luke 627, I love you, my son. He scanned the room and closed his eyes. Jason released Leroy's hair and stepped back. That holy shit don't work here. Cliff checked the monitor. Leroy's pressure had fallen 82, his pulse now 140. Cliff rubbed his forehead. Give him blood, O negative, is all we have. Wait a minute, Mike said. He turned to the trooper. What was he in for? Jose stepped to the side where Leroy couldn't see him. Abducting and raping two young boys. Someone stabbed him near the elementary school. One of the nurses took in a quick breath. Next to Cliff, Mike said, Jesus H. Christ. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to apologize to you for reasons I can't remember when this comes. There have been lots of important moments in throughout history. Her next reader, Hannah McCall, is a co author of her poetry collection, Fighting Monsters, and the limited edition artist book, Songs Waiting for Dust. Her short fiction and verse have appeared in the Clarion Awards, Overman, Australian Short Stories, The Adelaide Review, Poetia, and Curtis In 2002, she co founded the Portland based multilingual magazine Job Shack Quarterly with Harvey Graham, and they co founded Got Few Books. She continues at both imprints as commissioning and distributing editor. Welcome. <laughs> Thank Dominic for giving me this spot. 
Um, it's an act of generosity, and from everything I've seen over the last year or more since coming here, generosity is the animating spirit of this group and vision. Thank you very much. I'm going to read uh, seven very short pieces. They are short. Uh, they all share the same title, and uh, that shouldn't actually be helped. <laughs> Crucifix one. If you want a forest, you're going to have to pull it out of my feet, out of my skin, out of veins jumping with exhaustion, out of the hollows of my bones. The scorpions have been frightened. You're going to have to stand my body on a rock, nail my hands to the wheeling stars, let my tendons twist and turn and knock. Let the wind of the standing darks beautify the centuries. I can set the blue feet around my fingernails, dangle it sidewise in the sun, knit and pluck and pull my chest, back, neck, arms, thighs. I'm a little glimmering collection of ribs that hang down in my flashes. Scorn lengthwise, bury them parallel and parallel and parallel, lying on the earth. Go back in my 12 inch midnight flow, cast aside the spleen and the liver and calcified mush. Go straight to the cracked black stone of my heart, rewater and restore it, water into the roots. Hope that still contains the soft, complex stem cell of the world. Move the belly from side to side. Let the entrails spill out. The ovaries gleam in a river of blood. Die there. Incise upwards to the heart. Flip it out, also on the ground. Let it palpitate, come to rest. Dogmeat, hang your limbs, dreadful. Kiss on upward into the brain with a stiletto, missing you with tool. Up through the pineal into the jugular of the foot. Liberate the soul. Sever shame from shame. The hollow between the last ribs on the right from the room between the last ribs on the left. The throbbing fingertips from the side of the skull. Carved down from the armpits, scoring the bones. Score the legs also. Let them fall open, the meat hook from the sky, loop through the crop. Hoist them haul. Let them be drained. Let your currents become transparent as though it had never been. Oh, poor out the fantasy of love. The open lips, the small, bright, round, yielding breast, and direct to the limit. Send the eyes and tongue, to lip and tongue, the battle of ghosts in my neck, the sandy sacks of unborn pussy further down. Send your fantasy of regard and cherishing, the wrinkled satin pumping under the hand, peeling downwards with smallest eye. Send me the final fantasy of adoration. Now it's open with praise and softness. The touch like rain is falling on the skin. Oh, cover me with flowers while the white afternoon takes me to part. So here I hang or stand, lashed or nailed to this fine piece from Bethlehem wooden steel and leave you a centurion. I've seen you before, I guess where you shouldn't have been. Most of those eye whites puddling out from my feet have seen you before too. They've come to watch the death of God, come to see what sort of demons they are, squirming in his tomb. And the rest have come to see the marvelous artist, carpenter, architect, founder of the Destiny School, all organic, he treated mud, the very animal flow of water and water, last night in my visible and cry out at the final cessation of the contract, as though they never complained about the cabinet joints when the villa was finished. Come back. We can't pay for that. The English doesn't work, but I'll make it work, is it not? As though I hadn't seen the wish the Roman cloaks around the corners, figured out the high holiday stands and kept my mouth shut anyway. Genius works with you, must. As though the Spirit of God could never finally stop transforming the world and possibilities, no matter what they did, 
to God, the world, and possibility. You've got to be good. You've got to be good. And in her arena, son, a circle of unhappy wives, the gifts carved stairways of Eden crystal stains towered into God, while rivers of blood and marble continue to flow within them, and wives and heretics continue to burn above them, and the women the same continue to go around them. Let me go away. Your God is alive and still each other. And so you're such a pain. What is this prison on your skin, this wall, this sagging, this crawling of pipes and downspouts and poor mental housing, this objective mortar, this overworked thinking, this grid of constraint? What is this landscape plaster, this pasty gravel, this elevation? The world on my skin is huge. Open, my skin. Stretch me. The line that binds the roundness of the world runs arm to arm with me, wrist to wrist. Leave my breastbone open to the birds. Let beautiful mountain tops rise beneath my nipples. Let the sky drink from me. Let its feet catch fire from the rain between my hips. Let clouds appear over my hold. Let the high waters stand on the shelf behind the alkali sky. Track me through love's broken shell, its open hollows, its murdered arcs, its cast off elbows, its thin abandoned skin. Track me through this flesh red rubble. I have fallen into the rain. I am less than smoke.
much, um, Dami, for having me, and um, and for everyone who is already a great supporter of Nailed. I know that many of you are, and we really appreciate yeah. your readership and also your submissions. Um, we're always open to submissions online. Nailedmagazine.com. like a broken window held with tape. We don't know what to call it. All the half bites of burger still stuck to the plate, and the yogurt going sour under the tiny fridge light bulb. We couldn't even finish the single pint of eggnog before it turned to stucco, our leftovers mostly procrastinated trash. As a half of bottle of wine turns to vinegar, and everyone is drunk when Grandpa comes out of the room, he's sort of quarantined too. He's in the bathrobe again, and the whole terry cloth open, the sash tied and just naked besides the white stripe of linen across his stomach. He's talking too close to my face, saying I have beautiful breasts, and looking at them, and asking me to give him a kiss, like I'm a hen who's asking to give him an egg. The dishes are cleared and scraped into waste. We all look pregnant and switch to brandy. And then Grandpa's leaning in, cross-eyed at Michael's lips, explaining his wife had a tilted womb, and in order to conceive, he had to enter from the rear. This, and dessert, none of us can swallow. Feel the heavy cream rising up like some backward avalanche. We want and want and want one thing until it is all we have to spit out. Decisions that were mistakes no one could admit. 
Mother tried her names on like cashmere she couldn't afford, her heart an empty wallet. My dog, my name was a dog always about to be whipped. Half brother's name, a remnant of our penniless days, came out like a sigh of no. And the latest parent, we hardly uttered his name until made to, forced to come kiss him goodnight where he zoomed into television from the couch. He was soft between the rooms when I met him, I was eight. Back when I would startle awake from ruckus voices bleeding in my head, the child of phantoms shimmying down the ears, something wicked, something to call the exorcist over. Rough night of sleep as so often I believe the house was destined for flame and billows of gray hotter than the sky. He was a vision of all right, waiting for us to call him a word that gave us to him. Father, a strange lie and mother without any criteria for this titling. And so his fault find, finding and anger darting straight for my name meant I was always failing the father, a contrition never severe enough, always leaving me wanting to know when I'd be permissible to at least feel like a broken candle that still lights. Thank you. <laughs> Dad 
taking the picture or not, but she never looked at that that way when I was around. The photo and the yellow edges, so you knew it was very old. Bright sunlight coming in from some windows. Mom's gold blonde hair, not dirty at all. Each photo was a world I didn't know existed. The purple were brighter and the faces of the grown-ups were of people smiling. But there were so many times when their smiles looked so fake. Like one of those Hollywood sets where the front of the buildings is the old west, but behind it there's nothing there. I must have moved on to something else after opening that photo album because I left it right there on the kitchen table. The thing I did next was what I always did when I needed someone and there was no one around. I lost my headphones, the only way I had to escape. I put those things on and listened to the only record I had, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> had to be so careful with that record. I pulled out the record from the sleeve, my hand on the sleeve and my other hand on the record. I couldn't just put my hand anywhere on it. My thumb was on the thin edge and my middle finger was on the sticker in the center. If I touched any other part, it would skip, and I didn't know how to clean it. Went over to my turntable and lined up the hole with the metal pointy part of the record player. Then came the worst part. I had to lift up the needle on the record. Here's where I sometimes got the timing all wrong. I put the needle down too fast and I scratched the record. And here's where I had to play it cool. As much as I wanted to hear the song, I had to pretend to be not in such a hurry. I took a deep breath. Reach my hand out, the end of the arm with the needle on the cartridge, and I lifted that thing out of its home, and the record started to turn, and the pink arcade old cow started going around, and that little handle on the side of the cartridge lowered it down to the two grooves on the first track. It's got to be track one because staying alive is track one. Track one is the most dangerous because it's the hardest groove to get that needle right down the needle before the start of the track at just the right speed. The needle was just above the first series of grooves on the record, and there was a crackle and a slight boom, and I got that needle right where it needed to be and no scratches. My headphones, two brown pods with a volume knob on the left bone and a tan strap to connect it to. Slip those babies on, touch the cool of the silver blue circle above it with the cost pro 488 in big letters like it was written on the side of an airplane. Plug my headphone jack right into the turntable, no speakers. My headphones were the only way I could hear staying alive, hear chop-chop violins in outer space. <laughs> what happened when I put that jack in and the first few notes of the song came in? All the bad stuff, the sad picture of dad, mom being all gone, all of it went away and I could be a kid again. I felt like I was in an airplane seat with like all the stewardesses bringing me all the soda and peanuts I wanted. We were flying around the surface of the earth and our destination was Planet Disco, a planet filled with glitter and chest hair. Yes. <laughs> I was so in my head, I couldn't see what was coming. So many things to do, so many ways to fuck them up, you know? And here's what I fucked up. I'd taken that photo album that was on the shelf that I was never supposed to touch. That photo album with the cool line room, red and silver all over the front and back, the spine. Left it right on the kitchen table. And Dad came home, the first thing he sees is that picture. And from what I know now, the full story was that moment in the blue ravine. And even when he was young, even when he was a dirty hippie, he didn't feel that great. He felt the opposite way that is supposed to feel sitting with the sun in a kiddie pool on a summer afternoon with a beer in hand. That photo and what it said to him, how even in the happiest times, that was miserable. I didn't know any of this back then. I was in disco heaven. <laughs> I was upstairs on my bed with my head back on my pillow and my eyes were closed and those headphones, the things that mattered most of all, the cost pro double A's on my head, the way those headphones felt on my ears, the connection with music I had that was stronger than the connection I had with anyone. Mom painting me was the closest thing I had and mom didn't paint me anymore. Then the temperature changed, the air sucked out of the room, opened my eyes and there was dad, red tie, white shirt, helmet hair, dad. Two fingers of his on the little space between my neck and my shoulder. Two fingers pressed down and my whole body locked into him. His voice, that put a range fire voice all up in front of me and all around. I told you never to touch anything on that shelf, he said. That album, that picture, you listen. You can't listen, he said. Your brain is filled with shit. And Dad took his hand and he whisked my cost four double A's off my ears. The feeling of them off my head, felt naked without them on, 
pulled out the headphone jack out of the record player, the way it felt about the things that matter most on my head, nothing to protect my head from all the bad in the world. Dad with my crossbow double A's in his hands. There were so many things his hands could have done. Could have taken them away until I stopped fucking up, but he didn't. Those phones in his hands, his arms up and above his shoulders and fast down on the floor. I didn't see his hands move fast. No, I saw the whole down, slow down destruction of them. My headphones were on the floor of my room, and not just on the floor, already one of the phones was loose from his hand straps and then down put his foot down. The most important thing, my cost for double A's. His friend, Henry Wilfer, his right one, such a dark pink shade of shoe, it was almost red. That tassel up and down on top of his pen loafer, underneath his shoe, the heel, under that heel, the smashed plastic of the two pan phone pods, my headphones, and it sounded like mom reaching out and holding me. I loved them so much, I couldn't believe they were made out of plastic. First day I got them, I thought they'd last forever. You listen to me now, Dad says. His face. I want to say that his voice and the whole Oakridge fire deal had me locked in when I was growing up. The truth is, I didn't even look up at him, not once. Just stared at the wreck of the headphones under his shoe. When Dad walked out, those penny loafers, his dark pants, white shirt, how his shirt was always tucked in, even at home, his back to me, walks out. On the floor of my smashed headphones, how both pods had these deep cracks in them with chunks of wire hanging out. The speakers underneath the plastic phone, how small they were, how something so small could put out such power. And for the first time all summer, I didn't say I was sorry. Thank you. submitted his first query letter at age of 15. He graduated from the university, university with an acronym entitling him to say, I majored in English literature. He can be found diving into his journal just about anywhere in specific your class, and Braddon is his first published novel. Welcome. <laughs> is about a, uh, an author dissociating his identity from his troubled father. This is from Mark. There is no ambition to write. This is forced. Two women behind the cafe counter are speaking of their fathers. One's father was an alcoholic who died around the time she was born. Other things also occurred in her life. An Asian couple sits in the corner speaking in a language I cannot decipher. The emphases on his consonants reveal nothing to me. Focusing on these people is easier than focusing on myself. My friend, who is most forgiving with me, called me moments ago crying. She is through with me and my problems. She says, I want a normal relationship. I was just about to call her before that, tell her I was two miles away from Foothills Mall where my homeless father hangs around. She is justified in her feelings. She is not doing this to ruin me. She's doing this because I am ruining us. I have a bad habit of talking to other women and flirting, gaining their verbal affection and then dropping them once I feel desired. We could go on and on with my mommy and daddy issues all day. My friend cannot experience the four miles of running through the heat of West Hollywood to find a postcard. She has not yet received the five other postcards mailed to her. She, she saw the bouquet of flowers I ordered and had delivered to her workplace yesterday, but she does not see them now. While she is most forgiving with me, she really should not be. She says she wants a normal relationship. I cannot look my father in the eyes and say hello. I cannot embrace him. 
I never wanted anything to do with anyone in this family. A transgender escort dominated me for $160. The sex operators and local phone chat lines charged $10 per 20 minutes, 50 cents per minute, jacking off. 66 something hours of chatting over several years, dissolving 4,000 some dollars, eight bi-weekly paychecks at minimum wage, roughly four months of solid work behind a video rental store counter. Time spent coming, frustrated seed. A girl turned 19 and massaged me with honey and oatmeal. Oils finishing with a hand job for $120. A 30-something year old mother danced topless in my lap charging 200. A high school graduate cuddled under my arm, hands between her legs, pleading that I feel how wet she was. A lonely wife emailed an invite for nude video chatting. A younger lonely wife kissed my neck. A divorced 20-something moved from Vegas and placed my hand on her left breast. Tell me how hard this makes me. <laughs> Tell me if this hurts, a man said his hand the first to stimulate my flaccid adolescent organ. Him 19, me 12. Do you want Lou? I don't have any condoms. Tell me how bad you would like this to hurt, the transgender escort said. Tell me how badly you want to be inside of me, the high school graduate said. It has to hurt. It has to bleed. Young man, prey creature, Time urges, never heals. I love you, my friend says. I love you, I say. What she does not see is how frightened I am, cornered. Nature plays masochistic. It, I, me, him, father, son. We are one. Nothing numbs. Members shriveled in these aging palms. Rejection, race, 
and <laughs> trash talk. I can't remember the full name of it, man, but. The Trash Talk Lounge. The Trash Talk Lounge. Which is, yes. Right, which is all like supporting those of us stupid enough to want to publish it. Who, who send stuff out and always get it back, and we're, I don't know why we're surprised. But Davis, this is, this is dedicated to you because I actually sent a piece out for the first couple of times, the simultaneous submission is like kind of a standard thing, you know? And this got accepted like multiple places. They actually had to say, no, you can't publish that. That's right. So this is a, non, a total non-crisis in exactly seven parts. One. Your dog snores, your lovers snore, and you snore. Not all at the same time. First it's your lover. It's weird how she's first to start. How you don't have to touch her, let alone make her come. And she's first every time. She might have spent the entire day studying for the LSAT, or packing up Christmas, or obsessing over the budget that you have no idea is an actual budget. <laughs> you have no idea because it's not a budget for money, it's a budget for time. Time that isn't yours, doesn't belong to anyone but her. Time that arrives in little blocks when she checks her email, or plays an extra round of Candy Crush, or borrows the car to swing through McDonald's for a dollar Coke and a small order of french fries. What's not so weird though is how closer to the budget your dog is than you, which is almost certainly why you usually fall asleep last. <laughs> Two, your mother and your ex-wife finally have a legitimate relationship with genuine communication and full real appreciation for one another. This is something that could have only happened with your moving out that Easter Sunday a few years ago and discovering that Central Illinois takes shit like that totally to heart and completely personal. That's why you couldn't find a single movie theater open for business anywhere between Normal and Naperville that day, and you consider dri driving all the way to Canada. You fucking drama queen. <laughs> Number three. Your vet tells you your dog Sparrow's developed a food allergy and needs to go, and needs to go totally grain and gluten free. <laughs> A big reason why is because you feed him every scrap of pizza crust and you and your lover carry out two large pepperonis and a double order of crazy bread from Little Caesars. Sparrow, he's crazy for that shit. But it's killing him. It's fucking killing him. Your vet tells you this and uses the curse word in everything. Tells you this on the phone when you return his call. You thought you would heard that wrong, yeah? You didn't. <laughs> or, the daughter you have with your ex-wife, you got to choose her name. Your ex-wife, who was your wife then, she said you, she wanted you to. You gave her your mother's name, Bernice. After you made your choice, you weren't so sure your wife wanted you to. You felt almost immediately that if she could, she would take that back. If she could, she would hop in the DeLorean and skip the whole choice thing entirely. If she could, she would have rather fucked Marty McFly than you. <laughs> Five. Bernice lives in Chicago and interns for Teach for America. Your lover, she hasn't met Bernice, and you won't let her. No one, loves your, no one knows your lover's name in your entire circle of family and close friends. Your lover, she hates Obama. Your lover, she is constantly complaining about the Affordable Health Care app. Your lover, you stalked her on Facebook, and you almost gave everything away when Bernice posted on your wall to say hi, but you were logged in as your lover and responded as your lover, and then had to scramble to delete your likes and responses, and that caused yet another more epic fight, the end of which you're pretty sure you've yet to see. Six. You reconciled with your ex-wife briefly over 4th of July. Bernice was there. The three of you went to Michael's and bought make-your-own-jewelry box kits to build together at the lake house. You bought a wood-burning iron, too. The, third, the three of you built your jewelry boxes on the patio with a breeze in your faces. You used the wood-burning iron to scratch sayings underneath the lids, so when you opened each box, a saying was there. It was like a gift. You scratched, families are forever into yours, and scrawled a crude heart around the first R. 
For you just fell asleep after the big fireworks show on Lake Michigan, and your ex-wife asked you to make love to her, and you did as she asked. And then a few hours later, she asked you to do it again, but she didn't ask so much as tell you, and she didn't use the phrase, make love at all. <laughs> and you did as she asked and told you in pretty much the exact intensity and fury in which she demanded it. The next time, though, you saw that jewelry box, it was in a padded envelope, just splinters and singes and screws. So, I mean, Bernice is pretty much invisible on Facebook anymore and hasn't updated anything there for a while. She still texts, though. You have your set to make, you have your phone set to make a special sound when she texts you. It's the sound of a clown honking a horn. <laughs> Most months you hear it a couple times, but there are a couple of months you don't hear it at all. Your lover texts you all the time, hundreds of times a day, so much that you're just able to tone for her entirely. <laughs> These days, you find yourself contemplating blocking her altogether, and you consider this way more than you used to way more than you ever imagined that you could. The only number you've ever blocked is your ex-wife's. When you were still married, neither of you texted, and only your wife carried a cell phone. Your wife, she called you on her way home from work, and you stayed on the phone with her as she rode the train with the bus to the car, and a lot of nights she brought home Kentucky Fried Chicken or cheeseburgers from Wendy's, and you watched Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, and then put Bernice to bed. There was never a ringtone for her, for your ex-wife, until after the divorce. And there was never her asking you to love her either. Those were the days when your statuses didn't need updating. Thanks a lot. So this is something no one's heard before. Is this weird? Okay, so this is a piece from my novel, uh, Where the Jersey Devil Lives, that nobody's heard before. I'm in the final stages of it, and I'm loving lingering in places and finding little spots to just drop in and find some new love for it. So um, this is, uh, you don't need any other context except Bruno's his mother. Uh, Bruno's his father, uh, mother is his mother, and um, 
All the other names are other kids at school as well. Oh, and Frankie is his brother. Um, when I was a little boy and I would get in trouble, the worst part of all was waiting in my bedroom for Bruno to come home from work to decide my punishment. That in itself is a strange memory for me because for most of my life, it was always mother you had to tell what happened, mother who got pissed off, and mother just who decided how to punish you. But not when I was little. After Bruno came back from the war, before he became so pathetic, Bruno was the one who, who you had to wait for to tell you what you had to wait for to tell what you did wrong at school, or how you got even with Frankie beating on you, got even with Frankie beating on you by putting thumbtacks under his sheets, and how you laughed so hard when Frankie jumped into bed and screamed bloody hell. In my house, you learned to fight early. And always, every time, after being sent to my room for the afternoon to wait for Bruno to come home, always, I crawled under the bed and into the corner to hide a dark secret hole where I waited for the world to fall down on top of me. The time I remember it most clearly, that waiting, kindergarten, first grade maybe. Even back then, Mar Marissa Macaluso was a pain in my ass. On the playground, Marissa Macaluso was playing four square with Patrick Kelly and Kathy Rosen and Kimmy Will. Patrick Kelly was my desk partner, and he had red hair and blue eyes and freckles like mother, Irish eyes, mother called them. And I wanted him to play in the jungle gym with me, but he wanted to play with the girls. I sat on the bottom rung of the jungle gym, and man, even then, I can see it so clear, right out of the gate, I always felt like a fucking chump. Probably didn't even know the word yet, but I was already it. And wouldn't you know it, Marissa Macaluso wouldn't give the ball to Patrick Kelly, and he was laughing at her, with her, not getting mad for, holding, for her holding on to the ball, but I was getting mad for him. They both looked at Kimmy and Kathy, then laughed at them with their hands up on their mouth, saying, I dare you, go to go ahead. Do it. Marissa leaned over to Patrick, and we were all little kids, and we're all the same size. But back then, everything seemed so big. The whole world was that playground, that jungle gym. The whole world was Marissa leaned into Patrick, and a kiss on the lips for just a second, a peck. And Patrick wiped his mouth with his hand, saying, ew. But he smiled, too, a big, bright, sunny Irish smile. And the other kids, the boys and girls standing around, and Kathy and Kimmy, all of them watched Patrick and Marissa, and everyone laughed, except me, baby chump. All I could think of was mother, and how when mother got mad, the whole house would shake. Near the jungle gym was a big stick. I mean, I guess it wasn't very big, but like I said, we were little kids and everything was huge. It was a gigantic stick. It was the biggest stick ever. And I picked it up, and the whole wide world of those stupid other kids, and the stupid jungle gym, and the stupid kiss, they meant only one thing, and everyone knew what it was, that meaning, except for me. I was outside it. I just knew I had to walk up to Patrick Kelly and start beating him over the head with the stick. Kimmy and Kathy and Marissa started screaming and crying, and Patrick was yelling from the ground, and there was blood on his freckles and his stupid smile, and his blue Irish eyes were crying. I kind of lost it all there for a few minutes. Next thing I knew, I was sitting outside the principal's office crying, but no one cared, and no one talked nice to me. Then Mother arrived to pick me up and take me home. Mother silent in her old Chevy car the whole way home. Not a word. I was sniffling, doing that crying, whining thing, people, the crying, crying, whining thing, hoping she would answer me or talk to me, but she didn't. Her huge sunglasses covered her eyes, so you couldn't tell when to shut up or when to push it. She had her fat hands on the station wagon steering wheel, on, on the Chevy steering wheel, and her fingers punched the metal buttons on the AM radio to get the preset station. She turned the volume up to high, pulled me closer. In the driveway, she shut the car off and the radio cut off, too. Mother pulled her sunglasses off. A deep breath in those eyes, the way her Irish eyes can be so startling blue, full of everything she wasn't saying. Giant blue maroons full of hurt and that god-awful way you can feel so small and you have committed the most grievous sin of letting her down and that I better shut up and do as she says and not push her. All in that look, and I couldn't bear it. I had to look away, the shine of the chrome buttons on the AM radio. Finally, Mother talked, the sound of the hurt worse than the look in her eyes. You go right to your room and wait until your father gets home. You think hard about what you're going to say to him. The disappointment in those eyes. I thought I raised you better than that, she said. That few, that few hours under my bed was the longest in my life. I hid out down there, feeling like the worst person in the world. 
I didn't even know why I had beaten Patrick Kelly with the stick. What that weird feeling was I felt when I saw how he looked when Marissa kissed him. Blue eyes, just like mother's. And he was supposed to be on the jungle gym with me. <laughs> that waiting, it was just the worst thing ever. Hours, years of misery, exposed. Time slowed to all the worst ways you can imagine yourself. The anticipation of your punishment for not really knowing what you did, but you knew it was wrong and you didn't know how to do different. Bruno's car pulled in the driveway, door open and closed. I wanted to run away. Deep in my belly, I wanted to puke. Then the front door opened and slammed shut. I crawled out from under the bed before Mother shouted for me. I was ready for her, standing at the bedroom door with my fingertips on the scratchy wood, breathing, trying not to faint for this terrible fear of my father, with the shame in my body of that look in Patrick's eyes and that uncontrollable arm of mine raising and lowering that stick again and again and again. Mother, Oliver, get your ass in here. The long walk down the dark hall, all clutter and picture frames, one foot at a time. My life was over. Mother handed Bruno a beer, and that way her mouth presses into a thin line. I swear these kids, they're going to be the death of me. Bruno, my father, so big and powerful to me back then. How men think, how they talk, how they teach you to be like them, like you would want to be like them. Bruno crackling open his can of beer, his filthy jeans and dirty hands, the way he looked at me, giant black eyes over the rims of his glasses, bushy long biker beard. My father, he scared me. I loved him. I told him the story, how I remembered it, the way little kids talk and you can't really understand them blubbering and breathing funny. I left out the surprise on Patrick's face and the blood and his freckles. I had to tell it fast or I was gonna puke. Well, it turned out Bruno didn't give a good goddamn. He just laughed. Bruno laughed and I couldn't believe it. He laughed into his beer and reached forward, patted me on the head, and I guess he understood sort of, but not really, because he said, attaboy, soldier, that'll teach that little fucker to mess with a GNA, or a girl that a GNA likes. <laughs> and Bruno winked at me, the eyes of my father, all that black hole inside brown iris, something inside there, the way men think, attaboy. I remember mother getting pissed, kind of remember them fighting after that, but it wasn't really unusual and may not be true that day. What I do remember fully is feeling such relief. That whole time I waited under the bed, I thought Bruno might, I don't know, hit me, maybe kill me, the way little kids can be so afraid, giant nightmare fear of the whole world wanting to fall down on you and swallow you whole. That was it, I think. I had unknowingly committed a great sin and the world was pissed off and was passing judgment on me. Forever, I was ruined forever. And then I was saved. I had nothing to worry about because Bruno, because my father took my side, except it was a lie because I hadn't been mad because Marissa kissed Patrick. I was mad because Patrick kissed back. He was supposed to be on the jungle gym with me. And I knew, even then, even that young, even as baby chump, I knew that Bruno and mother and everyone else, that great big giant world, all of them, I knew them not knowing the truth was the only thing keeping that whole entire world from falling down. Yeah. Books. <laughs> um, <laughs> plenty of sex. 
but he explores many types of love and all the ways we look for love and give love. Um, read his books and his music will be in you forever. Generous, you were right. He is one of the most generous artist teachers I've ever known. He's created a space for writers, a safe space, and asked them to go to, to the dangerous places. The moment when something happened and actors were changed, then go deeper and then go deeper still. Then you find your voice. Your voice is you at the core, your music. It's the one thing to find your own voice like this, and it's one thing to watch another writer find his or her voice like this. It's, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm humbled and honored to witness it on Thursday nights. How can you help not falling alone in love with someone who helps you and others find their voices? We are all alone in love with Thomas Grandfather. Yeah. You don't understand, I say. 
you want to be the drama or watch the drama? <laughs> Screw me, Hank. But for Christ's sakes, I'm in jeans and a t-shirt. I'm in, I'm in jeans and a blue shirt. You want to disappear, right? I say, well, believe me, right now, you look like a straight guy, Hank says. Yeah, I say. So let me give you some homosexual leather, hair, leather bar fashion tips. <laughs> but the way you talk about it, Hank says, these guys don't care about fashion. I'm just saying there's a uniform, I say. We're not a lot of variables. Plus, I say, you're beautiful. Come on, Bernie Hank says. And we need to put a lid on it, I say. Believe me, you walking into the spike looking like a beautiful straight guy. Every man in there is going to want a piece of you. <laughs> At the back end of my apartment, really only two steps from my writing desk under my loft bed, just at the door to my bathroom, I have a little space only I ever go into. The only other place in my apartment where two can stand but nobody ever makes it that far. On the wall by the bathroom door is a full-length mirror. To the left, there is a bookcase and my stereo. On the other side, under the steps up to the loft bed, my closet, my chest of drawers. A space shaped like a horseshoe, horseshoe, just long enough to lie, just long enough to lie down in, wide enough to turn around. How many nights I've danced in front of that mirror, the fluorescent, light from the bathroom slanting down in to the Suban Dross, Teddy Pendergrass, Barry White, Randy Crawford, the, Re the Reverend Al Green. That night that Hank steps into my place where only I've ever where, 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 where. that night that, that Hank steps into my place where only I ever go when he stands in front of the mirror what I planned on doing is getting Hank out of that blue ironed Oxford shirt and into something less bad boy on the street. But when Hank walks into that private space of mine, there's something in my chest that can't and I can't breathe. Propinquity. Hank's just right there and he's taken off his blue shirt and it's for sure I'm gonna fall over. I take his blue shirt and hang it up on a hanger. Then it's a sparkling white t-shirt you can see his nipples through that's gotta come off. So the t-shirt comes off, and there I am standing in the tiny space holding on to Hank's white t-shirt that smells like men's dick and Hank's subway ride from the upper west side. In order to get to my chest of drawers, I gotta move, and there's no way that I can move, not touch Hank's naked arms, or his naked back, or his naked chest, or all of the above. So I do what I always do when I don't know what to do, drop what I'm doing and grab whatever is nearest. Hank's white t-shirt is on the floor, and what I have in my hands is a Marvin Gaye album, and I put it on the turntable. <laughs> and then I maybe touch Hank's naked chest and back a hundred times. I stand there trying to find breath, watching the turntable arm lift up, watching the turntable arm move over onto the record, watching the turntable arm hit the record, <coughs> that crackle. That quick, it's magic the way things happen with Hank, Gotta give it up starts playing. I'm rummaging through my chest of drawers look for God knows what. Gotta give it up, it's the best dance song ever. Sure enough, Hank starts da dancing with himself in the mirror. Same way I dance with when I'm alone, in the same spot. So how am I supposed to look, Hank says. Hank looks exactly the way he's supposed to look and that's the problem. Incognito, I say. Laugh me, Hank says. <laughs> Hank goes to the fridge and gets more beers. He wants to hear Gotta Give It Up again. So I pick up the turntable arm, that loud record crush through the speakers, set the turntable arm back down, and Gotta Give It Up again. Hank hands me a beer. We touch glasses to a toast. And before we know it, we're fully involved. Hank and I are dancing and carrying on and shit both posing in the mirror before, before Madonna even knew anything about it. <laughs> Things go from bad to worse, and instead of going to my extra large t-shirt drawer, I go to my disco trunk. In no time at all, Hank and I are deep into disco drag. I, forgot, I forget all about dressing down, and we're dressing up <laughs> in that tiny place. 
no more standing outside the wall. I done got myself together, baby, and I'm having a ball. Trying on outfits for the leather bar the way two high school girls try on dresses for the prom. Really, I wonder if I ever lost the heart. At one point, Hank was wearing the black platform shoes with green glitter on them. I wore a Hershey phone, a pair of white silk boxer shorts with an embroidered snake coming out of the fly, <laughs> a black fishnet wife beater, and a blue sequin skull cap. <laughs> Me, I'm in a black leotard and a leopard skin t-shirt and a bowler hat. <laughs> Showing up like that at the spike, shit, we'll never get past the bouncer. <laughs> when Hank and I finally get out of the apartment, it's past midnight. Hank's wearing two or three old t-shirts of mine, black and extra large that hang down over his ass. Big sleeves that go down past the bell ropes. A pair of my work boots, a size too big, and my old green expandable baseball cap that comes down to Hank's eyes to cover up his shiny black curls. An old thermal sweatshirt with a hood. I wear the same thing, only different. There we are, Hank and me, covered up, dressed down, anonymous males, going to the place that is the extreme of male a homosexual leather bar, the spike, and the around, around, macho pose, the top, the bottom, do si do big hard cock, stare down, sex dance, and the end of the world. What life is like on the golf course. <laughs> with tips. <laughs> 